Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. In conjunction with the Baptist Theological Union, the Divinity School has named an alumnus of the year annually since 1947. In doing so, the union and the school have sought together to honor a graduate who has shaped a career of unusual distinction in, as the citation reads, the field of religion. The Divinity School's self-understanding throughout its history has been that we train scholars for careers in the professoriate and the ministry. The list of honorees reflects those professional trajectories. Names such as Luking, Cole, and Buchanan stand side by side with Mays, Ogden, Chop, and Lafleur. In doing so, the Divinity School pays tribute to the fact that the vocation it shares with this university to be a teacher of teachers achieves its realization in crucial respects beyond the confines of this building and this campus. The same must ultimately take its bearings from and receive decisive evaluation through the work of its graduates, who really do commence in other contexts upon graduation. This occasion today is thus both a wonderful opportunity to honor a specific individual who has done just that, and also an important annual council to institutional humility. The alumnus of the year is chosen by the Baptist Theological Union in consultation with the Alumni Council of the Divinity School. The BTU is a unique entity in American higher education. It has a historic and ongoing affiliation with the American Baptist tradition, but it serves a non-denominational, university-related divinity school. This arrangement is a synecdoche key of the values that Chicago has always represented. Disinterested, excellent scholarship that is fully engaged with the lived realities of religious traditions in the world we inhabit. While this commitment is never simple and its history is complex, it remains fundamental to this day. Now today, we gather to hear from the celebrated Robert Michael Franklin, Jr., Ph.D., 1985, from the Board of Trustees of the Union, his name the Divinity School's 2010 alumnus of the year. Dr. Franklin is the 10th president of Morehouse College, the nation's largest private four-year liberal arts college for men. Robert Franklin is himself a Phi Beta Kappa 1975 graduate of Morehouse, where he took his degree in political science and religion. While there, he also undertook international study at the University of Durham in England as an English-speaking Union scholar. Upon graduation, he continued his education, first at Harvard Divinity School, earning a Master of Divinity degree, and then at this Divinity School, where his doctoral work concentrated in ethics and society and religion and the social sciences. Since his graduation, Dr. Franklin has served on the faculties of the University of Chicago, Harvard Divinity School, Colgate Rochester Divinity School, the Interdenominational Theological Seminary in Atlanta, and Emory University's Canberra School of Theology. At Emory, he gained a national reputation as Director of Black Church Studies and was named the Presidential Distinguished Professor of Social Ethics, under the auspices of which he provided leadership for a university-wide initiative titled Confronting the Human Condition and the Human Experience. He was also a senior fellow at the Emory Center for Law and Religion. Dr. Franklin is also, I'm delighted to report, an accomplished administrator. In addition to his current position in 1997, he assumed the presidency of the Interdenominational Theological Center, the Graduate Theological Center of the Atlanta University Center Consortium. Through the years, he's also found time to provide commentary for National Public Radio's program, All Things Considered, and weekly commentary for Atlanta Interfaith Broadcasting Television. He also has served as Program Officer in Human Rights and Social Justice at the Ford Foundation as an advisor to the Foundation's President on Future Funding for Religion and Public Life Initiatives. A penetrating commentator on the media and religion, Dr. Franklin also was invited by American film producer Jeffrey Katzenberg to prepare an online study guide for congregational use of the Prince of Egypt, a DreamWorks film. Dr. Franklin is the author of three books, Crisis in the Village, Restoring Hope in African American Communities, Another Day's Journey, Black Churches Confronting the American Crisis, and Liberating Visions, Human Fulfillment and Social Justice in African American Thought. He is also a co-author of the Divinity Schools, Thomas Browning and others, a volume titled From the Culture War for Culture Wars to Common Ground, Religion in the American Family Debate, and he is co-editor of the forthcoming Cambridge Companion to Martin Luther King, Jr. 
Jr., published by Cambridge. The title of his address today is Nurturing Citizens Through Liberal Arts Education, Reflections on Dr. King's Unpublished Papers. It gives me enormous personal pleasure, not only an institutional delight, to invite you to join me in welcoming back to School Fall, the 2010 Divinity School of Wellness of the Year, Robert Franklin. Coffee shop downstairs. 
We took naps in obscure corners of this building. We look forward to Wednesday lunches. Do you all still have those? Yes. Wednesday lunches when faculty members and offbeat alumni, <laughs> anxious local pastors, marched before the firing line to present their novel conceptions of being, non-being, and the sacred. We listened politely, ate our spaghetti, and imbibed obscure but affordable libations. <laughs> We asked often obtuse and occasionally questions. The spirits are joining us. I shall be careful as I speak about this. Irreverent and impertinent questions, perhaps sometimes, because we live in a state of perpetual pre examination terror and ABD neurosis, all that dissertation. A syndrome that compromises the human's ability to calibrate how she or he is relating to strangers. But some of us actually believe that the more ruthless our interrogations of a speaker, especially an outsider, the more the speaker should be gratified that she or he was being paid the highest possible swift haul compliment, that of being taken seriously enough to arouse a serious interrogation of their methodology, warrants, and claims. I pray that no such graduate students are with us in this audience today. <laughs> but in reminiscing about this great hall of inquiry, during one particularly difficult wintry season, I found myself in an unsettled mood. I had recently read Dr. Mays' autobiography, Born to Rebel, and in it he reflected, and I quote, In 1932, I finally returned to the University of Chicago to complete coursework, write a thesis, and seek to pass all the examinations. Regardless of one's previous academic record, he takes a risk when he announces his intention to earn a PhD, especially at an institution like the University of Chicago. It was the prevailing opinion that the university made it difficult for those who sought the degree. And it was rumored that approximately half of those who started out in the department in which I was enrolled failed to accomplish their goal. I knew a few persons who had failed their PhD work at the University of Chicago, and it seemed to me that they never were quite the same thereafter. A man, a person who seeks a doctorate and fails to earn it, seems to go through life either apologizing for his shortcoming or overcompensating for the failure. Now that's quite enough to turn an ordinary day into a very bad one. <laughs> but I'll always cherish the day when redemption occurred as I walked out of the Swift Commons downstairs after a Wednesday lunch and noticed a wall plaque that gave me the impetus to complete my work here. Since I was not a history student, I did not make a special effort to read random plaques hanging on these walls. <laughs> on a day when I was feeling the burdens of life and study in Chicago, and just on the brink of self-doubt and depression, I walked past that plaque that contained a list of alumni of the year, and found Dr. Mays' name there as the third recipient in 1949. Somehow, that was the confirmation that I needed. Suddenly, I was no longer alone at Chicago. My college president had been here, and Vinny Vinny Vici. <laughs> the words of Julius Caesar, he came, he saw, he conquered. <laughs> Benjamin Elijah Mays was a remarkable man who lived from 1894 to 1984, 90 years. Born in rural Epworth, sometimes identified as 96, South Carolina, one year before the death of Frederick Douglass, and a year before the national ascension of Booker T. Washington as the nation's most influential black leader. Mays attended high school at South Carolina State College in Orangeburg and graduated as valedictorian in 1916, one year after the death of Booker T. Washington. He pursued his undergraduate education at Bates College in Maine, anxious to compete intellectually with white students and other ethnic groups. Imagine the shock of transplanting from rural South to small town Maine in the early 20th century. 
At Bates, Mays was a prize-winning debater. Attended the, he later attended the University of Chicago Divinity School, as we know him. He earned a PhD here in 1935 and went on to become dean of the Howard University School of Religion. By the way, at the time, the president of Howard, his first African-American president, was Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, also a Morehouse man. And he served as president of Morehouse from 1940 to 1967. After retiring from Morehouse, May became president of the Atlanta Board of Education. I've always feared that people would regard his as a very distinguished career of steady downward mobility, <laughs> moving from a graduate theological seminary to an undergraduate men's college to the public school system. But in fact, Mays was ahead of his time in seeking to impact the character and the intellectual development of young people as early as possible. He went to Morehouse with what I want to suggest was a Chicago point of view, promoting the value of the classics, conversation, attention to method and the structure of an argument, and critical thinking versus minimizing facts. He transformed Morehouse into a remarkable school. One could say that he was the Robert Maynard Hutchins of Morehouse, or that Hutchins was the Benjamin Mays of Chicago, a compliment that both men deserve. During his years at Morehouse, some of the 20th century's most influential thought leaders, change agents, and impatient activists studied at Morehouse and received the benefit of Mays' leadership. Among his students were Martin Luther King, Jr., NAACP Chairman Julian Bond, Surgeon General David Satcher, Ebony Magazine Senior Editor and my friend here today, Lerone Bennett, Atlanta Mayor, First African American Mayor, Maynard Jackson, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Louis Sullivan, and National Science Foundation President and Morehouse President Emeritus, Walter Massey. Other luminaries were attracted to Morehouse for the May's legacy, but missed him having retired by 1967. <clears throat> they included Spike Lee, Samuel L. Jackson, Olympic gold medalist Edwin Moses, CNN commentator Jamal Simmons, and many of the gentlemen gathered here this afternoon. Now, my purpose is to offer a perspective on how we can prepare the next generation of leaders who will sustain and strengthen American democracy. The quality and kind of education of the leaders who, who will inherit the most powerful positions in society really matters. If they are selfish and broke, we will all suffer. If they seek only to make money, get elected, hoard material goods, and enjoy fame and pleasure, while manipulating working and poor people and voting against their own best interests and scapegoating other groups for economic troubles beyond their actual control, then society will sink to debts that will make it reasonable to exhibit hostility toward poor people, nonconformists who defy convention, ethnic minorities, immigrants, and others. I will illustrate the kind of educated mind we need to nurture with reference to Dr. King's unpublished and lesser known works, including many of the papers we have on campus at Morehouse today. Part of the reason for this source set is to highlight the fact that Morehouse College now owns and is custodian of the 10,000 piece Martin Luther King collection, but also to utilize the life and mind of one of the world's most admired leaders to make a case for education that places moral purposes at its center. To restate my thesis, I believe that universities that provide broad liberal arts education can shape good citizens and social leaders through a subtle but profound process of moral recentering in critical dialogue with professional and scientific specialization. And I think that Dr. King's unpublished papers and less well-known writings offer thought-provoking examples of what one school, Morehouse College, nurtured King and his peers, a model evident in many other institutions, 
institutions, especially at this university. And so my talk divides into three parts, beginning with reflections on the University of Chicago during the Mays years. Mays observed Robert Maynard Cutchins leading change in the academy for the public good. It was a model of being an activist college president that deeply impressed him. Then we turned briefly to Morehouse during the King years, which in fact were the Mays years there. During that period, Mays created Morehouse in the image of Chicago, not Harvard. That may seem a bit sacrilegious to some. <laughs> the Morehouse emphasis on broad liberal learning prior to specialization, along with a strong emphasis on leadership development, public service, and social justice, made Morehouse stand apart, stand apart among its many liberal arts peers. This was Mays and his faculty leading change in the academy for the public good. Mays constantly looked at liberal arts education through the lens of society's greatest problems and opportunities. Since racism, imperialism, sexism, class exploitation were the chief social challenges of the, that time, he sought to calibrate the education at Morehouse to be both universally relevant, applicable, but also immediately socially impactful. And then finally, I'll offer some reflections on the challenges of liberal learning and moral recentering now in the Obama years, a period of enormous opportunity that is daily besieged by hyperpartisanship, the narrowing of the American mind, and a retreat from social justice and the common good. And so first, Chicago during the May years. As many in this room will know better than I'm me, Chicago began in 1891 with a $600,000 gift from John D. Rockefeller and the boundless energy and vision of its, first, of its president, William Randy Harper. Harper grew up in New Concord, Ohio, a Scotch Covenanter family and community that valued education. He learned to read when he was three, entered college at 10, received a BA degree at 14, and a PhD at 18. He also loved music, played the piano with the college, with the college president's daughter, and led the New Concord Silver Cornet Band. In college, having mastered the usual Latin and Greek, he, be he began learning Hebrew with a small class and continued studying privately for three years while working in his father's store. In 1872, his family sent him to Yale for advanced study. Yale was the first American school to grant a PhD degree in 1861 and had conferred only 35 before Harper graduated in 1875. Lacking the background of his older classmates, he nonetheless caught up with them and successfully completed his dissertation titled, A Comparative Study of the Prepositions in Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, and Gothic. <laughs> Those were long, cold afternoons. <laughs> when the American Baptist Education Society formed two years later to plan a new Baptist university Midwest, Harper was invited to join the Committee of Nine to plan the institution. John D. E. Rockefeller had met him in 1886 and was impressed with his energy and ideas. Rockefeller supported the Baptists' plans, although initially only for an undergraduate college, and offered an initial $600,000 for endowment if they could raise another $400,000 from other sources. A board of trustees was formed in 1890, and one of their first actions was to nominate Harper as president. Harper envisioned a university, not a college, and would not accept the presidency until he was promised a free hand in developing the institution along the broad lines he wanted. Additional funds would be needed to support Harper's scheme, and Rockefeller pledged another million. Harper officially accepted the presidency in April 1891 and took office on July 1. Under Harper's plan, the University of Chicago would include an undergraduate college, but senior professors would be free from heavy teaching loads in order to pr pursue research. 
In addition, Harper projected extension work and a university press as key elements of the university. The adult education programs he had developed as an adjunct to his teaching would, would be given full status within the university's curriculum. While these plans were being developed, Harper had to recruit a complete faculty, amounting to 120 appointments by the time the university opened. He had to oversee a selection of the student body, over 3,000 students applied for admission, and 520 showed up on opening day. Supervised the construction and equipping of university buildings, including classrooms, laboratories, libraries, and housing for faculty and students, and raised money for the original funds given by Rockefeller and the American Baptist Education Society were quickly seen as inadequate. Harper's appetite for work was legendary, both his ability to plan large endeavors in broad strokes and his concern for details, such as the planning of the academic ceremonies, which he loved. After the university opened, Harper continued to develop new departments and in, all su in subsequent years added professional schools for medicine, education, and law, primary and secondary institutions, which merged to form the laboratory schools, and museums for paleontology, anthropology, and oriental studies. Pressing the urgency of needs for more facilities at the spring convocation in 1899, Harper said, and I quote, patience sometimes ceases to be a virtue. <laughs> Some of us who ambitiously claimed to be young men when the university opened its doors must now acknowledge that old age is creeping rapidly on. We cannot wait. We cannot afford to wait for time, end quote. Perhaps echoing the sentiment and ambition of Harper, this university's current president, Robert Zimmer, who extended his regrets in writing to me last week, that regrets that he would not be able to join us today, observed in his address at the university's 500th convocation on October 9, 2009, I quote, the establishment of the University of Chicago was in fact a transformative moment for American higher education. The approach and attitude of the university at its founding have not only resonated through our own history, but had a powerful influence on the evolution of research universities throughout the nation, end quote. The approach and the attitude of Chicago. The earliest African-American undergraduate alumni of Chicago were Cora Jackson, Spencer Dickerson, 1897, Richard Robert Wright, 1901, it's not the famous novelist Richard Nathaniel Wright, Monroe Work, 1902, John Wesley Hubert, 1903, that list continues. The first African-American graduate alumni were, to work, 1903, Carter G. Woodson, in 1908, and the famous surgeon Ernest Everett Just, 1960. Woodson, you will recall, was the founder of Negro History Week in 1926, that later became Black History Month. By 1943, at least 45 African Americans had earned PhD degrees from the University of Chicago, more than any other university in the country. 1943, 45 African American PhDs. Mays initially began his work at Chicago in 1921, but left at the invitation of Morehouse President John Hope. John Hope, by the way, was Morehouse's first African American president, who served from 1906 to 1931. And he accepted Hope's invitation to come and teach mathematics, psychology, and religious studies, and to lead the debate team. He then returned to study during the summers and earned two degrees from Chicago, a master's degree in 1924 and a PhD in 1935. When Mays returned to pursue his doctoral work, the focus of our concern, the president was the inimitable Robert Maynard Hutchins, who led Chicago from 1929 to 1951. By the way, the other well-known black college president of this era, in addition to John Hope at Morehouse, was uh, Mordecai Wyatt 
Johnson, I alluded to earlier, who was president at Howard University from 1926 to 1961. Although William Rainey Harper helped to found the University of Chicago, giving it form and life and mission, Hutchins is still regarded as the intellectual mastermind of the modern great university. He said of his years at Chicago, and I love this quote, this is Hutchins, our idea there was to start a big argument about higher education and keep it alive. <laughs> Hutchins was the son and grandson of Presbyterian ministers. He attended Oberlin College for two years and then went on to Yale, where he completed the BA and law degree. In 1929, he moved to Chicago to become the president of the University of Chicago at the age of 30. Through his contact with Mortimer Adler, he became convinced that the solution to the philosophical problems facing the university lay in Aristotelianism and Thomism. In the 1930s, Hutchins attempted to reform the curriculum of the university along Aristotelian lines, only to have the faculty reject his proposal for reform three times. He believed that the great books, this is another great quote, are the most promising avenue to liberal education, if only because they are teacher-proof. <laughs> He served as editor-in-chief of great books in the Western world and was less interested in practical or applied knowledge than in theory and the philosophical underpinnings of knowledge. Hutchins, Hutchins noted that, and I quote, when young people are asked, what are you interested in? They answer that they are interested in justice. They want justice for the Negro. They want justice for the third world. If you say, well, what is justice? They haven't any idea. <laughs> Hutchins said, and I quote, a university should not discriminate by race, and a university cannot talk about the limitations of social tolerance. A university is supposed to lead, not to follow. It amazes the student body while this president is saying this thing. A university is supposed to do what is right and damn the consequences. As long as we are a university and not a club, we cannot invoke racial distinctions as a basis for the selection of our students." Mays had always wanted to attend Chicago, especially after his high school teacher, Mr. Nelson Nix, instilled in him a desire to study here. Nix, who earned a degree in theology from Benedict College, had spent a summer at Chicago, but Mays lovingly recounts, he spoke of that summer with such pride that one would have thought he had earned a PhD here. <laughs> Despite his early romanticizing about Chicago, thinking it would be at least as open and liberal as Bates College in Maine, he quickly became a sober realist about the color line in Chicago and at this university. And born to rebel, Mays reflected, and I quote, there were still areas of prejudice and discrimination that I kept bumping into at the university, and it was not my nature to leave them alone. <laughs> Negro friends advised me not to tackle with these problems. One man tried to convince me that I would never get an advanced degree by protested discrimination. But I found it hard to believe that the professors in my department would penalize me for fighting injustice in a great university, especially when I was not asking them to get involved. <laughs> But Mays had confidence in Hutchins and believed he would respond to outright examples of discriminatory behavior. Here at this divinity school, Mays did most of his work with Professor Edwin Albright, a nationally, nationally known theologian who taught here from 1933 to 1945. Mays observes, and I quote, my major professor was Edwin Albright, professor of Christian theology and ethics. My forces in that department were about equally divided between Edwin E. Aubrey and Henry Nelson Wyman. My philosophy courses and philosophy of religion courses were taken with Wyman. Aubrey was hard, and his former students advised me to avoid him. Shayla Matthews advised me to take Aubrey's courses, and I took them. When I got an A in Aubrey's first course, I was delighted and I continued to make A's in other courses. 
end quote. By the way, this reference to Henry Nelson Wyman, of course, an eminent theologian and philosopher, was the source of Dr. King's dissertation at Boston University. He did the comparative study of the idea of God in Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wyman. Mays also notes that Dean Shirley Jackson Case's concentration was early Christianity. His books on the historicity of Jesus, which de-emphasized the divinity of Jesus, did not endear him to conservative Christians of the day, who carefully examined his books, nor win friends for Mays in this segment of the church. Mays' master thesis was written in the early Christianity department, and Case, Shirley Jackson Case, was his advisor. The thesis was titled, and I quote, the survival of pagan religion in early Christianity, a topic that created problems for Mays among the fundamentalists, particularly when he was nominated to become president of Morehouse. Mays was quickly branded as another Chicago heretic. I quote, it was in connection with my thesis that I learned that Dean Case was kind. After completing writing my master's thesis, I left the manuscript with Dr. Case to read. When he had finished the reading, he sent for me and he made a few minor suggestions, and I was afraid that he would not accept it as final. When I defended my thesis for the PhD degree, I was sitting among six professors in the Divinity School. Dean Case was among them. I defended the thesis with no difficulty. So Case is reflecting on both those who taught him, shaped his mind, but also the quality of friendships and, and the support, the communitas of the experience in this very building. Mays pursued his studies at Chicago and wrote a dissertation. The dissertation title was The Idea of God in Contemporary Negro Literature, making this one of the first dissertations outside the field of sociology to focus specifically on African American studies. One professor did not think he could write a dissertation on this topic but later recanted when Mays proved him wrong. Mays took a summer course with a Professor Sullivan on the authority and prestige of the, of the Catholic Church. All the students in the course were required to submit a paper, and Sullivan announced that the best paper in the class of 20 was written by Benjamin Mays. That same evening, oddly, Mays received a late night visit from a classmate who began by admitting his prejudice toward blacks. He said he wanted to see a paper written by a Negro that Professor Sullivan said was the best in class. Major accounts, I handed him the paper, and after reading it, he said, it's a pretty good paper. <laughs> I replied, Professor Sullivan thought it was excellent. <laughs> speaking, I asked him what he meant. He replied, I got a B. I replied, good. <laughs> he said he had never known an intelligent Negro before. There were a few in my town, but I, I never knew them. This incident, Mays reflects, was, is one of my personal experiences that can document how divisive and cruel segregation was at the time. Mays also studied with J. Edgar Goodspeed and J. DeWitt Burton. Mays called Burton one of his ablest teachers. When he called on Mays in class, Mays always spoke of being scared, and he was surprised at the end of the quarter to receive an A. When he was acting president of the university, Dr. Burton lifted the ban on permitting blacks to use the recreation facilities in Reynolds Park. The next president, Hutchins, was a lawyer, and at 31, considered to be the youngest president in the history of great universities. I take it that he started at 30 and turned 31 in the course of that year. Different sources report 30 31. He was deemed a radical in the field of higher education, was thought by many to be a genius. One manifestation of the title was the bold decision and experiment to permit the brightest high school students 
who could pass an entrance exam to be admitted directly into the PhD program, perhaps reflecting Hutchins' desire to attract more faculty administrators who were in his age cohort. <laughs> Hutchins also abolished the football program. Decision that has evoked all sorts of love and hate on this campus. <laughs> but I found this interesting, and when one reflects it, uh, Mays was here at the time. Because years after Mays' retirement from Morehouse, Mays continued to serve on the Morehouse College Board. And when then President Gloucester, who succeeded him at Morehouse, presented his vision of building a football stadium right in the middle of the campus, Mays vehemently opposed it. <laughs> May said that he loved the Hutchins family and he considered them to be his friends. But one reminder that Hutchins was a man of his time is the interesting relationship between Mordecai White Johnson Howard, and Hutchins, who shared correspondence. Johnson invited Hutchins on many occasions to speak at Howard, but he never did, never accepted, always making excuses about his wife's health. Speculation was that Hutchins never quite got over the fact that the African-American preacher, Dr. Vernon Johns, defeated Hutchins at Oberlin in a Latin exam before the entire college. <laughs> Dean Lawrence Carter of Morehouse College uh, indicates that Hutchins had, prior to the debate, announced that no Negro could master Latin. <laughs> Mays reflects in Born to Rebel, the last seven quarters at the university between 1932 and 1934 were hard but exciting years. My one disappointment was my inability to complete the thesis in time and receive the degree before I went to Howard in the fall of 1934 to become dean of the School of Religion. The doctorate was conferred in March 1935. And now on Morehouse during the King years. By the time of the founding of the University of Chicago in 1891, Morehouse had been founded in 1867. It was already a growing entity for a quarter, a quarter of a century. By then, Morehouse had moved from Augusta, Georgia to Atlanta and experienced the second of its three name changes, Augusta Seminary, Atlanta Baptist Seminary, Atlanta Baptist College, Morehouse. As noted earlier, both Morehouse and Chicago owe their origins to corporate titan and philanthropist John D. Rockefeller, to some extent. Morehouse, like its sister institution, Spelman, emerged from the ashes of the Civil War and was established on land near downtown at Rockefeller Domain. But unlike the Chicago case, no vast monetary endowment accompanied the founding of Morehouse. Although the land was certainly a valuable and much appreciated gift, Rockefeller knew that institutions could not easily thrive without startup capital to sustain multiple endeavors of a high quality, from mobilizing facilities to attracting faculty, student scholarships, hiring effective administrators, and so on. Part of the answer to this apparent discrepancy lay in Rockefeller's approach to philanthropy. Commenting on that method, Ron Chernow wrote, while he had the option of distributing his educational largesse widely, such dispersed giving didn't jive with his philosophy. In religion and education, no less than in business, Rockefeller thought it a mistake to prop up weak entities that might otherwise perish in the evolutionary race. I think mistakes are being made, he said, organizing too many feeble institutions. Rather, consolidate and have a good, strong, working church organization, he wrote in 1886. A remark that could have applied to his educational views. In the long run, Rockefeller transposed to philanthropy the same principle of consolidation that had worked so well for him in business. We move on. <clears throat> When King entered Morehouse in 1944, he encountered a unique intellectual oasis, a place where young African-American men would be encouraged to read widely and to think deeply. Morehouse was now known for its high expectations, its group mentoring approach to nurturing students, 
its holistic developmental model, and its use of inspirational leadership to mobilize each student to find his own voice. When he arrived in 1944, Mays was, was beginning his fifth year as president. <coughs> Most of us are familiar with the rough outline of King's life who entered Morehouse in 1944 as an early admission student at the age of 15, following in the footsteps of his father and maternal grandfather. He never graduated from the Booker T. Washington High School where he would have in 1945. In 1944, when he entered the college, we also note that Swedish scholar Gunnar Merle published an American Dilemma, his landmark study of American race relations, noting the inconsistencies of the country's democratic ideals and its practice. Like other students of his generation, Dr. King was largely influenced by Mays, his moral, intellectual, and spiritual presence, tower over the Morehouse campus, something that Ron Bennett has written eloquently powerful about over the years. While he did not teach any classes, Mays held forth each week in the daily chapel services. All students were required to attend chapel. There he shaped the social, political, ethical thought of young men who were required to participate. Every Tuesday morning in the historic sale hall, Dr. Mays would hold forth on a wide range of topics. Few subjects were off limits. In fact, Dr. King commented that it was at Morehouse where he encountered a free atmosphere and where he first heard open and honest discussions about race. It was here where King states, I realized that nobody was afraid. Now, Mays was a humanist and strong advocate for social justice. He was particularly outspoken about racial segregation and quick to underscore the injustice of it. He discouraged students from visiting local area theater, theaters and other places that routinely discriminated against them. As a theologian, minister, scholar, and administrator, Mays used his position to affirm the dignity of his students and to uplift them on a consistent basis. In the course of daily chapel services, Morehouse students were exposed to a wide range of national and international speakers. For instance, during King's first year at college, he heard the National Secretary of the NAACP, Walter White, who gave a challenging address on the twilight of white domination, and A.J. Mustin, Executive Secretary of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, reflect on the dynamics of pacifism. Not all speakers were men. During the course of King's matriculation at the college, notable women, such as Mary McLeod Bethune, appeared as well as Eleanor Roosevelt. Mays elevated the chapel experience to the distinction it continues to hold up the college today. We should all note that the Chicago approach that Mays installed at Morehouse began to beat resistance as a new cultural revolution began to sweep across America in the 1960s. Indeed, the Chicago approach also seems to work well here at Chicago. <coughs> as students demanded that we re-examine our assumptions about the canon, which theories and books deserve to be included in the sacred canon. But this was a revealing observation by Dr. Mays. Since I retired from Morehouse College, I've discovered a great deal in talking with many angry black students on both white and black college campuses, hearing things I had never heard or, heard or knew during my 27 years in the president's chair. At Morehouse, I had tried to develop an academic community that was supra-culture, supra-race, supra-religion, and supra-nation. I tried to build this kind of college because I believed then, as I do now, that unless we succeed in building this same kind of world, mankind's existence on Earth is indeed precarious. I knew I could make little impact on the larger society, but I did what I could in the small area when I felt that black students generally shared this philosophy. But I have found since 1967 that this is far from being a universally accepted view among young black students." End quote. In the final analysis, Morehouse was Mays' laboratory for greatness. His students acquired learning that enabled them to change America. 
That pragmatic test was enough to validate his the adaptation of the Chicago approach to the black experience. As for the value of Morehouse and the historically black colleges and universities, of which there are 105 today, May's student Martin Luther King Jr. was exhibit A to the world, demonstrating the value of a value-centered education. Let's look for a few moments at a thought-provoking examples from Dr. King's lesser-known publications and, and writings, unpublished writings. I think this will provide a better window into the understanding of sociology and psychology. His writings reveal him to be a practical theologian who respected social scientific data and analysis. For example, King could appreciate the historical and psychological work of Kenneth Clark and John Hope Franklin, whose scholarship in their respective fields helped to ground the argument for the 1954 Brown segregation, desegregation decision. In another instance, he was deeply appreciative of America's symbolic foundations as seen in the frequent use of biblical allusions and references to the following documents, such as the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. But it was precisely this symbol mastery that enabled King to frame the civil rights struggle as a moral drama with universal appeal, indeed a classic of and for the human spirit. The Morehouse College King Collection contains 10,000 original items belonging to King, including his seminal speeches and other writings. We have 1,000 of his books that he used uh, as a working pastor, theologian, and leader. Dr. King's intellectual breadth is best evidenced in the Nobel Prize Collection delivered in Oslo in December 1964. What's interesting is not so much the dress that we all heard or that we have on the record, but the multiple outlines in his briefcase, uh, the notes and the drafts and speech that were included in our collection. Uh, one, some will regard that speech in 1964 as King's most mature and deeply philosophical work. The Nobel election expands eight pages of text, reflects a lifetime of keenly intelligent reading of scripture, philosophy, theology, as well as the humanities as expressed in eloquent references to literature and poetry. This lecture is, I quote, an exhortation to the world to end human suffering by embracing nonviolence. Dr. King said, in a real sense, nonviolence seeks to redeem the spiritual and moral lag as the chief dilemma of modern man. It seeks to secure moral ends through moral means. Nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon. And King goes on to contrast violence with creative, healing, and unifying principles of love upon which nonviolent philosophy is based. He quoted John Donne's meditation, No Man is an Island, which he previously scribbled down 10 years earlier inside the folder containing his trial sermon to the people of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. The Nobel Prize lecture results from a great synthesis of King's thinking over many years and is reflected in these numerous bits of paper that we were able to recover. In the early drafts, we observed nascent ideas and undeveloped arguments filled with potential. We observed his strenuous word, wordsmithing, on each page, and one can imagine King's mind at work percolating ideas and testing persuasive communication of them. Something known to all of you who are here, who are writers, these literary fits and starts suggest how much King relished clarity and precision as he expressed himself on paper. But second, King and materials indicate that he had an enormous appreciation for the transformative power of a well-spoken word. While his rich baritone voice could magnetize an audience in itself, King's arguments were always carefully and explicitly crafted. From his liberal arts preparation, King mastered the classic art of rhetoric, having read Plato, Aristotle, and the other great thinkers. His speeches routinely and formulaically followed an appeal to the intellect, an appeal to the imagination, an appeal to the heart, not unlike Aristotle's suggestion. In the I Have a Dream speech that we all know, considered a masterpiece of rhetoric. It's 
clearly apparent in his lesser known speeches that predate that iconic dream speech came testing language, testing phrases that would work well together. Boyle's place a strong emphasis on public speaking, as previously noted. By the time students graduated, they were well trained and confident in speaking before large audiences. By the time King reached his final year, he had experienced a variety of speakers and could deliver his own memorable senior sermon in the Sale Hall Chapel, one that his classmate, Dr. Samuel Boyce Cook, tells me was a tour de force on moral law. King also developed a strong appreciation and affinity for the spoken word in the rich African-American religious tradition in which he was reared. The practice of slipping away from his own home church to listen to guest preachers at Wheat Street Baptist Church and other congregations was also noted. Third, I want to highlight that King, of course, was a citizen of the world. Following the Montgomery bus boycott, he traveled extensively, delivering sermons and speeches around the world. And in 1954, he and his wife Coretta traveled to Ghana, where they joined scores of other world leaders in witnessing Ghana's independence from Great Britain. Uh, the bottom line we make here, a point we make, is that King was well read, well spoken, well traveled, and a well balanced individual. He brought these experiences from the Morehouse setting to bear upon his public leadership. Finally, King possessed the skill and art of criticism. He was well read, well spoken, well traveled, but also acquainted with the art of criticism, both in giving and receiving. Robert Hutchins said, there is only one justification for universities, as distinguished from trade schools. They must be centers of criticism. And Derek Bach, the former president of Harvard, observed in his powerful book, Our Underachieving Colleges, a candid look at how much students learn and why they should be learning more. He says in a quote, nationwide polls have found that more than 90% of faculty members in the US consider the ability of students to think critically and clearly the most important purpose of undergraduate education. King possessed an ability to be critical on many levels, social, institutional, and self-critical. He also engaged in an analysis that was critical, comparative, and constructive. As an advocate of the social gospel, King argued that it was the responsibility of the church to improve conditions for all people. He had offered scathing criticisms of American civil religion, and of a relatively anemic black church. Well, let me move to a conclusion here in this section on the mission of liberal arts and recentering moral citizens in the Obama years. The best liberal arts colleges prepare students with broad knowledge and help them discern the commonalities and differences among us. Bottom line is the best liberal arts colleges prepare women and men who are well read, well spoken, well traveled. About. Today, liberal arts education is more relevant than ever as we traverse multiple disciplines and incorporate new and innovative epistemologies. Tackling the big questions of our time will necessitate an excellent liberal arts foundation anchored by a strong moral and ethical identity. This is tantamount to becoming a well-educated citizen. The college years offer the greatest opportunity for impactful action in this regard. Morehouse has historically prepared its students to think critically and independently. The countercultural process of recentering and despecialization begins early, from the moment a student enters the freshman class and continues until he graduates. Although many observers have made a similar point, I find compelling Robert Bell's observation about the social and moral responsibility of education. He writes, in the broader perspective of liberal arts education, it is important to remember that science can produce information, but not meaning. What characterizes the humanities, however, in, a, in at least a partial contrast to the natural and social sciences, is the centrality of issues of meaning. It is not just cognitive knowledge that we need, though we are woefully short on that. 
There's also moral insight. And here, too, Americans are sharply limited. Our central tradition makes us think of justice only in terms of individual rights and, outside of the Catholic community, we have little understanding of the common good at all. Human rights as a set of norms are accepted all over the world, but in most of the world, and in Catholic social teachings, human rights include many social rights, the right to a decent standard of living, a good job, health care, and so on, end quote. Stephen Tipton of Emory University observes that King and Morehouse drew on a powerful narrative that assumed that churches and schools should, should participate in providing the kind of moral and civic education that would form citizens to understand their interdependence and give a thick meaning to the notion of the common good. When such a foundation is in place, a public moralist like Dr. King, or even today, Barack Obama, can call forth something deep within the American people that respects moral rhetoric and moves us to act for the common good. These traditions go back in time to the progressive era, especially to John Dewey and Jane Addams, but also to William Rainey Parker and the bold aspirations of this great university. Indeed, by nurturing such moral citizens, people with the brains and the heart to understand the common good argument. Universities like this one challenged the narrow, instrumental agenda of the modern research university. Of course, we can love the research universities for how they have enriched modern life, depending on your point of view. They've given us lasers, FM radio, magnetic resonance imaging, barcodes, transistors, improved weather forecasting, algorithms for Google searches, DNA fingerprinting, field monitoring, scientific cattle breeding, and global positioning systems. But we must be careful not to regard research and knowledge as an enterprise, or worse, an industry that exists to increase the comfort and convenience and satisfaction of people, deepening our narcissism and driving us further away from the public square. Many of society's greatest skills today now result from smart people educated in great universities who allow self-interest, the market, and an inordinate faith in science and technology to threaten our national soul, and in the case of nuclear weapons, threaten human existence itself. And closer to home, our national politics has been virtually paralyzed by narrow minds with loud megaphones who have polarized this great nation, have nurtured fear and anxiety, and thereby prevented moderate and progressive leaders and conversations, preventing us from installing a new narrative about the nation's possibilities in the world. This is the task now of liberal arts education in the following years. To open the minds of citizens who are ready for a more hopeful future and to connect or reconnect people in ways that Dr. King thought possible based on their shared apprehension of the common good. Harry Calvin Jr., the late University of Chicago law professor, wrote that by design and by effect, a university, and I quote, is the institution which creates discontent with the existing social arrangement and proposes new ones. In conclusion, we've suggested that at its best, the University of Chicago has been an incubator for nurturing democracy's creative dissenters. Some of you are seated here today. Even appointing people like Young Hutchins as president as a symbol of what this university was willing to risk to make a statement to the rest of the world of higher education. And we suggested that at Morehouse, a virtual army of creative dissenters was nurtured by Dr. Mays to rehabilitate America. King was only the best known, and his papers illustrate some of the intricacy and beauty of that dissent in process. Now the task is upon each of us not to align with a political party or a particular leader, 
but to join our neighbors, now a global gathering, in directing the flow of history toward justice and the common good. The heavy lifting we must do as a society must come from a mature and well-educated cadre of people who will help to redirect this and all nations toward greater sanity. King has a final word here. It is from a sermon titled Transformed Nonconformists. And that King says, this hour in history needs a dedicated circle of transformed nonconformists. <laughs> the saving of our world from pending doom will come not from the action of a conforming majority, but from the creative maladjustment of a transformed minority. May God bless each of you with a healthy dose of creative maladjustment. Thank you. I'm wondering, especially as I 
I sit here in Chicago, uh, where I grew up and where you grew up. Mm -hmm. How do you talk about getting to, even before you get to the book at college, what do you do to produce well-read, well-traveled, critically thinking young people in a public education system mm -hmm. that is just Movement. 
for the malcontent, informal malcontent. Informal is an important adjective here. <laughs> watching the healthcare uh, town hall meetings last summer. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, one would love to see this happen in the churches, for after all, there are, uh, the last count, I think I saw 340,000 houses of worship in the United States. There are only 4,000 colleges and universities, only 65,000 black churches. So just that differential uh, suggests that if we could stimulate uh, informed engagement of scripture, uh, of social issues in congregations, that would go in an enormous way toward moving uh, the nation forward and out of fear. I think people recognize they are afraid. They're afraid. They're xenophobic. They're afraid of their own future life prospects. How congregations speak to anxiety and fear and strength is important, but uh, <clears throat> my sense is that you know, in my focus, college and universities aren't doing a very good job of it. And we've uh, embraced a more modest and in some ways timid agenda, but not challenging, not expecting that it's going to be leaders, uh, but uh, uh, trying to simply focus on a, a discrete set of cognitive skills rather than more holistic, how you put this together as a leader and make a difference in the world. Of course, it depends on the missions of the institutions. Um, more of us tend to evolve, and we no longer refer to them as chapel uh, because of the religious pluralism within our community. And so it was now this same uh, convention is now referred to as a crown form, picking up on an image from the theologian Howard Thurman that above every Morehouse student's head is a crown in which he must grow uh, to, to wear. So uh, we we transformed that. I, I was thinking about Bennett and then here. Yes. Thank you very much for a great analysis. I don't know how you got that information in your one speech. It's really good that. Without being too critical, not you are being critical. Would you address for the moment the strange case of extraordinary university? Located in the middle of the black communities, on the, uh, on the edge of black communities. And the black communities is going to hell. Mm -hmm. And the sociology of these institutions is going to Excuse my language. Uh, can somebody speak to that problem when we talk about education? The south side of Chicago, the sociology of Chicago, they, they're two different things. It's conservative, the economic department, the conservative posture needs to be the world. I don't want you to be critical, but on a higher level, can somebody speak to this problem? The brilliant and rich universities, without any impact, really, without any positive impact, on the south side, which is how. I almost want to permit your words to hang in the air as a prophetic indictment and invitation for institutions like uh, this month or the others to, to take up that, uh, that matter in, in a more ambitious way, more than the mere uh, provision of volunteer students and programs and charity and bandages, but to engage in a more profound uh, way of level policy and power leverage and money uh, and, and, and the language that makes a difference. <clears throat> so uh, no I, I think you I think you right on. And I admire some efforts of some places in, for instance, University of Pennsylvania, trying to engage communities, but even there I think there have been mistakes made the efforts to, you know, uh, simply buy all the land and pull people away. Uh, and then sort of almost raise the board to start over. Uh, these, are, these are hard questions, but I, I think we have to grapple uh, with this, and I appreciate that. Yes. Let me come to class 56. I taught uh, in Morehouse on the base, in fact, uh, <coughs> from ITT. Uh, 
Listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. <laughs>